Okay, welcome everybody. Good morning. Thanks for the uh, in-person uh, folks who are here and thanks for the folks who have taken their time online. Um, and in particular, thank you, uh, Professor, for sharing your time with us this morning in uh, lovely Philadelphia. You've gotten kind of the whirlwind U.S. tour. So I'll give a couple of opening comments and then we'll get right into it if that works for you. Yeah, thank you All right, let's for do having it. me here. So again, welcome Professor Yossi Tam from Hebrew University in Israel. Um, for those that aren't aware, Hebrew University is uh, one of the most prestigious universities uh, around, but in particular in Israel, it's over 100 years old. old. Uh, it was founded by uh, some luminaries back in the day, uh, including Albert Einstein and Sigmund Freud, um, were ranked, you know, essentially the university is ranked number one in Israel uh, and in the top 100 universities um, around the world. So a very prestigious university where professor works. The faculty and alumni of the university have earned over eight Nobel Peace Prizes, and 30% of all of Israeli's academic science research takes place at the university. So again, a lot of stuff going on in a variety of different um, modalities. There's over 24,000 students that go to the university, and they come from over 90 different countries. The university itself plays an integral role in Israeli society, and they have various luminaries that have graduated from the university, including uh, folks on their Supreme Court, various presidents, various prime ministers um, that have also graduated from the university. That could be you in the future. Yeah, maybe. You never know. Um, the researchers are also having a worldwide impact on a variety of academic um, and international scientific uh, research and discoveries. Uh, again, it's our honor to bring Professor Yossi, uh, as he likes to be called, his real name is Joseph, but Yossi, uh, to Philadelphia. And we want to sort of, before we kick off, highlight the sort of direct connection that Hebrew University has to various institutions in Philadelphia, including Chop, Drexel, Penn, uh, Thomas Jefferson University, and the University of Pennsylvania. So again, without uh, further ado, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you here to Dwayne Morris um, and look forward to learning over the next hour. Uh, folks online, uh, if you have questions, type them in. I will obviously take a look as we go. I will be paying attention, of course, but I will uh, look for your questions and we will get them answered uh, towards the end. But if I see a, the right opening, I'll ask the professor to sort of identify um, and answer those questions. So we're going to do a little bit of uh, kind of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, which uh, for those of you familiar, that's typically my style. We're going to sort of talk about who, what, when, where, why relative to the professor and what he's doing and what the university is doing and how it relates to um, not only cannabis, but what cannabis is doing relative to the research that he's doing and where it's been uh, utilized out in the medical world and around the world. So let's start with like, who are you and uh, how did you get your start in uh, cannabis? Like it's kind of an interesting thing. So yeah. were you always drawn to cannabis as a job? What's going on? Uh, no, actually I was drawn. First of all, thank you for having me here. A a pleasure to be here in Philadelphia. And uh, actually, I, I wanted to become a dentist. A dentist? Yes. So I pursue a dental degree at the Hebrew University. And when I was looking for how to expand my, my uh, research avenue, because I was interested in research, I was exploring the, the, the corridors and I met the uh, professor, Raphael Meshulam, the godfather of cannabis in the hallway. And he uh, I asked him, okay, I know about pot, but what, wh what are you doing? So he said, are you familiar with cannabinoids? I said, what is cannabinoid? Cannabinoid pot, cannabis, of course. No, but he said, okay, so come in and you will probably leave dentistry. I closed my clinic. So he knew that up yeah, front. You 20 years ago, and I became professional in the cannabis cannabinoid field. Uh, just recently, I was the president of the International Cannabinoid Research Society and doing cannabis research. Fantastic. So are you still practicing dentistry at all or no. you're totally a no. researcher doing cool stuff? No drilling, no billing, just <laughs> cannabis. Just cannabis 24-7. Okay. And how long have you been doing cannabis research work? For 20 years. 20 years. Um, let's talk a little bit about then kind of as you were president of the association. Uh, what was that like and who was kind of involved in that association? So first of all, the, the International Association is a, a, a big uh, community of around almost uh, 1,000 uh, researchers working in the field all over the, the globe. Many come from the US, Europe, Israel, of course, and other countries. 
and we basically conduct basic translational and clinical studies related to cannabis or cannabinoids. Do you find that the folks, the scientists that are involved in the field, are they good sharers of information or is everybody kind of off doing their own thing? No, definitely. Definitely. We have an annual meeting every year. Uh, we gather, we collaborate, we write grants together, we participate in each uh, uh, seminars of the universities. And, and sharing information is very important in science. So we not only publish our papers and scientific achievements, but also, of course, uh, share our ideas, get some feedback, and uh, we become colleagues and friends. And do you feel like over the last, call it five, 10 years, or you've been involved for 20 years, do you feel like there's been a increase in the pace of play relative to cannabis, or does that just me projecting that because the United States is kind of waking up a little bit here? I think so. So when I started 20 years ago, I was a student, very just doing his first step in toward the, this uh, society. And you see uh, throughout the past few years, a change in the atmosphere, in the people that would like to attend so, uh, such uh, meetings. Uh, uh, many of them are, first of all, clinicians and that are interested in uh, uh, understanding, first of all, what is cannabis good for or not, and also the industry. So industry is becoming more and more involved. Uh, they have the capability, money-wise, to invest in technologies, drugs in this uh, area, and of course, to become the leader also. So do you feel like big pharma getting more involved in it, even though it's still uh, federally illegal in the United States? Do you sense big pharma sort of sitting in the wings waiting for the Controlled Substances Act in the United States to get changed before they really jump in, or are they already kind of quietly participating? They are quietly participating, the big pharma. Uh, now it's at the level of the biotech companies that will kind of uh, lead the field toward phase two clinical trials. And then if successful, big pharma will get in. Excellent. Um, let's talk a little bit about like the history of uh, cannabis, marijuana. Yeah. Um, I know you've got some slides that you want to share. So let's focus on that history for a couple of minutes if you want. Perfect. Perfect. Right. So uh, as I'm coming from the Hebrew land, uh, I would like to start by oh, there you go. giving you uh, the example that we think that cannabis was actually mentioned in the Bible. In the Exodus, it was called in Hebrew, Knebosem. But Knebosem was developed into cannabis and cannabis. So you can believe it or not, but... Uh, it, it, it was there, but going really uh, okay. backwards. So the five books we're talking about right. back in Exodus, right. okay. Right. Right. But the first attest for using cannabis is dated the 12,000 uh, 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 BC, uh, where uh, pale paleotelical studies attested that cannabis was already present and was uh, really uh, spread uh, throughout Asia. And it was called Ganzigunu, uh, the drugs that takes away the mind and uh, or Azaulu, the hands of ghosts, posing all, all of your limbs, maybe referring to the neurological uh, effects of, uh, of cannabis. But if you're really doing a, a great jump throughout the history timeline, the first use of medical use of cannabis uh, is known to be in China, okay? Where cannabis was used to treat malaria and gout and a GI uh, problem, gastrointestinal problems. And this led to the religious use of cannabis in India in 2000 BC. And further on, doing a really a huge jump uh, throughout the history, bring, bring me to uh, the Western world uh, where cannabis was first introduced and it was mainly used to treat, uh, not to treat, but to uh, uh, grow as a fiber uh, to uh, build ships and ropes and clothes and so on. And uh, it was first entered the uh, pharmacopoeia there. It was treated, uh, uh, it was used to treat uh, pain until aspirin was generated and was replacing uh, cannabis. Actually, cannabis became the persona grata in the Western society. Even uh, Queen uh, Victoria used cannabis for painful menses and uh, um, uh, Sisi, the Empress of Austria, was used to treat a cough and possibly also to stimulate her appetite. And I will touch base on it later on throughout my uh, presentation. How does it 
It's yeah. good because I'm sure that none of the people on the call have ever used cannabis. And so they wouldn't be familiar with kind of what happens sometimes when you right. smoke. Right. And but, do you, just to date back in history, um, not that we would go back in history, but how were they ingesting it? Was it in kind of smoking form or what was it crushed up in plant? What are we what are we talking about? We believe as a smoke. As a smoking. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Yes. That's the way. Um Moving forward, so actually surgeon uh, Russell Reynolds was the uh, British physician that was appointed to be the physician in uh, uh, ordinary to the Queen Victoria. And in 1890, he kind of summarized his experience, 30 years of experience with using cannabis. And he said that for the relief of certain kind of pain, I believe there is no more useful medicine than cannabis with our reach. This is a huge statement. So we haven't listened to this guy back in 1859 making that kind of commentary, yet we're still working through that. At this point. Right. And the question arises, why? So first of all, uh, there were a few obstacles. Uh, if you think about uh, the history of, uh, of cannabis and, and the legislation uh, part of it, uh, specifically in the United States, uh, and for almost 90 years, it was... Uh, since 1850 till almost uh, uh, 1940, it was used uh, in the uh, Western society. But uh, in 1937, the plant was de declared already illegal and entered into the prohibited substances audience. And the question arises why? why? And why it's because of this person, hey, Harry. Enslinger, who was the first commissioner of the Federal Narcotic Agency here in the state, which was well, later was developed into the DEA, the uh, Drug Enforcement Administration. And he felt that there was no uh, enough meat against, uh, uh, in the war against uh, heroin and drugs. And he put cannabis into it and he removed cannabis for the pharmacopoeia in 1942. And later on, uh, cannabis was, uh, was entered the scheduled four uh, substance of abuse drug together with heroin. Now, thinking about the golden age of cannabis, it kind of ended up around 1970 when cannabis was uh, declared as substance one a schedule uh, a drug of abuse, which means that it does not have any established medical use not for recreational, of course, and its safety and potency basically cannot be verified. And this uh, was actually led by President uh, Nixon, who declared this war against uh, uh, drugs in the States, established the DEA, and uh, cannabis became illegal in the state until 1996, okay? Okay. where there was a great change in the first state to approve cannabis for medical use was California. So we've got kind of a history of thousands of years of use around the globe. We've got kind of a regulatory regime coming into effect in the late 1800s, and early 1900s through the mid 70s, 80s, uh, declaring the United States kind of this war on drugs, which sweeps in cannabis, Correct. despite kind of history that indicates medicinal use and application. Okay, so we're now kind of in the 70s, 80s. We've got kind of a prohibition in the United States under the Controlled Substances Act, which includes cannabis, saying it's forbidden uh, in all states. And then we jump to California, then takes the big step to say, well, we don't agree. Correct. Okay, gotcha. But since then, I think uh, American is in high. Yeah, you can see that was how, a pun there, that pun. Uh, how yeah. many states actually decided to do it uh, differently and to approve it either for recreational, for medicinal use, or not at all, of course. Uh, but it's not only in, in the United States. It's basically all over the globe. Uh, you can see more and more countries open uh, uh, their borders, I would call it, to, to cannabis and allow it to uh, be used for recreational and, of course, for medical use. Research-wise, of course, it was allowed uh, to conduct, not specifically in the U.S., but uh, in other places. And so, again, is this proliferation, kind of, if you look at the dots on the map, is that like a last five-year phenomenon, or has that been going on for 10, 15, 20 years? I, th I think it's uh, like about 15 years. It okay. takes, but gradually increase. You can see the changes, 
but the real uh, uh, boom or change was happened uh, during the last five years. Last five years, yes. gotcha. Okay, so we've got kind of almost like a matching principle globally with the United States as more folks are re-recognizing or relearning the medicinal effect and or the efficacy, not necessarily of the THC piece, which we'll talk about in a bit, but of the medicinal properties that are involved in the plant. Correct. And okay. why is that? Is because this uh, small country in the Middle East called Israel that we believe, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm biased. No bias. It's okay. It's okay. No, no, You're no, all. <laughs> but uh, the fact that uh, everything was developed there and because one person, and one person is, we mentioned his name already, it's Professor Raphael Meshula. He's the godfather of cannabinoid research around the globe. Everybody uh, knows uh, this. So pause there for a second. Why do we call him the godfather? What did he do that was so special relative to cannabis? His work, his revolutionary work that actually was started in the Weizmann Institute in Israel. And then the Weizmann Institute did not really like the fact that he uh, does uh, research on cannabis. So he moved, moved to the Hebrew University. Later on, he became the rector of the Hebrew University and still at his age now, 92, he's still active. He's still mentoring students, coming to the lab every day. So this is a, a very a, a huge a, achievement. But his work was to identify the structure of the psychoactive component in cannabis THC and the non-psychoactive component. Uh, so he was the first. CBD. Sorry to interrupt. So he was the first one out of everybody to figure out that the here's what the structure is of cannabis. Right. And cannabis and the compounds inside it, THC, CBD, and other cannabinoids which we are calling phytocannabinoids. And understanding the structure allows you to, of course, uh, think about, okay, how does it work? What does it do? Which type of effect does it have? Without structure, you basically give a compound, but you don't know exactly how does it affect. So his revolutionary work that actually was funded by the US government, mm -hmm. okay, through the NIH, because it was not allowed here for almost 30 years, uh, actually expanded the research on cannabis. But it took almost 20 years to understand that the psychoactive compound THC basically activate a specific area in the brain. And it was later termed as the cannabinoid receptor. CB1 is the main receptor, and later on, the identification of another receptor in, in a, was a, a identified CB2 and was called CB2. And look at that, CB1 and CB2 basically are present all throughout our body. CB1 is the most abundant receptor in our brain, which makes sense why people consume uh, cannabis and immediately see an effect. But also in many peripheral organs like the liver, the fat, the muscle, uh, 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 the kidney, all of them express CB1. CB2 is the other cannabinoid receptor and it's present mostly in cells that are related to the immune system. So their distribution in our body and these discoveries that were made uh, during the 80s, basically we, we thought, or Raphael Meshulam thought, why do we have those receptors? Are they in our body because they are waiting for us to use cannabis? Probably not, okay? Because having an endogenous receptor could basically uh, relate it to the fact that maybe our body produces compounds that are mimicking cannabis or mimicking THC and CBD. And with this revolution, revolutionary hypothesis, he uh, took the initiative to find those compounds. And indeed, in a, around the 90s, he discovered the endocannabinoids, anandamide and 2-AG, as you can see here in the screen. These are compounds that any cell type in our body basically produces and releases, and they activate the cannabinoid receptors, CB1 and CB2, in a similar, kind of a similar fashion as THC and CBD does. So did he start out, though, looking at the plant and sort of dissecting the plant and what was in the plant and then move to the human body and to see or vice versa or a little of both? 
a little of both, okay. of course, but it's, uh, he started, he is a medicinal chemist. So he started with the compounds coming from the plant. Then he collaborated. This is another uh, 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 visionary uh, effect to know, to understand your capability as a medicinal chemist. You cannot do anything. So he collaborated with endocrinologists and pharmacologists and physiologists to understand, okay, so we have these structures, we have these compounds, let's identify the receptors. So it took a while to identify the receptor. Okay, so once the receptors were identified, they are probably being activated by endogenous compounds. So let's look for those compounds. And this step by step build what we called uh, the endocannabinoid system. Gotcha. The endocannabinoid system is one of the main physiological system of our body that not only works by itself, it modulates many of our physiological system, the nervous system, the respiratory system, reproductive system. So many of these systems are being modulated by endocannabinoid receptors, ligands, and therefore using cannabis from outside can affect all of those systems. And if we think about it, let's do a, a, a kind of a, a, an example. Okay, sure. let's try it. Uh, I told you already that uh, cannabis and uh, or cannabinoid receptors are present in, in our body. So look at the physiological effects that are modulated by cannabinoids. It can influence our inflammation at uh, the uh, level, cancer development, fibrosis, uh, uh, bone remodeling, and so on. But let's focus first on the brain. And I told you already that our brain basically expresses the CB1 receptor in very high level, okay? So each one of us have the CB1 receptor. And let's assume that we take cannabis, we take THC, okay? And we would like to understand what THC does in our brain. Since our brain is composed in many areas and many cells, so if you activate the CB1 receptor in one area that is called the hypothalamus, it will incre increases your appetite the munchies, as, as you probably know. That's the technical term. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> and, but if you activate the same receptor in the brainstem, it will release nausea, it will lower blood pressure, it will lower pain, spasticity, and tremor. If you do activate the receptor in the cerebral cortex, in the area around the brain, it will alter your consciousness it will uh, uh, impair your memory. It will may induce hallucinations. If you do the same thing, you took THC and you activate the CB1 in the hippocampus, it will impair your memory. In the cerebellum, it will affect your coordination. And this is maybe linked to the fact why we should not drive while uh, consuming uh, THC at high level. And if we do activate the cannabinoid receptor in the amygdala, it will change our anxiety level. Uh, it may induce panic attacks, lower traumatic memories, and decrease hostility. So the ability to sort of um, focus on particular parts of the brain and dial into them, does that exist at the moment based on kind of how much cannabis or how much THC one ingests or, you know, yeah? Definitely, definitely. Fascinating. But also we need to appreciate the fact that each one of us not only have the CB1, we have different levels of CB1 receptor, each one of us, and we also have different levels of endocannabinoids. So therefore, if me consuming THC and you, we will have a different, different experience. Effect, different experience. And you know what? Rafi Meshulam was thinking about this as well, because when he discovered the structure of THC, he went with the drug to his house, to Dahlia, his wife, and he told her, Let's uh, invite friends and please prepare a cake and put THC in the cake. Okay, we will cut pieces and we will give to our friends. Some see. party. Yeah, <laughs> that was the first maybe the clinical trial. We yeah, the first clinical trial. Right? Right? Exactly. <laughs> and when he, they do, they, they did so, uh, and he observed the the effect. He saw he didn't eat the cake. No, of course not. Of yeah. course, we are scientists. scientists. Yeah, <laughs> of course. So uh, uh, he looked at the, his friends. So one didn't have any effect. The other laughed all the time. The third one 
uh, uh, got a panic attack uh, that need to be treated. And so you got a variety of yeah. effects by having the same amount of THC, but the variety is because we do have different levels of the receptor, the endocannabinoids, and we are basically not the same yeah. at all. Uh, so Professor, could can one discern through some level of testing, blood tests or otherwise, how much a person is likely to react because of the receptors? Is that possible to figure out? It is, and we do so. We measure the amount of endocannabinoids. We assess endocannabinoid tone in each person or samples that we get with, because endocannabinoids are circulating in our blood and we are able to measure them. And while measuring them, we have the capability to say, okay, this person has a high tone and the other one has a low tone. And I will give you later on during my presentation an example, how do we utilize it to properly match the treatment to the tone? Okay, but stay tuned for the for the later. So I was gonna say, and so that sort of picks up on what you're talking about relative to the brain, the ability to sort of target therapy, uh, whether it's in the brain or other parts of the body, one would need to know kind of what the receptive levels are, and then the ability of certain aspects of cannabis to affect those outcomes. There, sir. Okay. Fair enough. And it's not only in the brain. Because look at what happened to CB1 receptor in other peripheral organs like the gastrointestinal tract, the pancreas, the muscle, kidney, fat, and a liver. Activation of CB1 receptor in those uh, 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 organs basically will increase the fat, fat accumulation, uh, induces fibrosis and inflammation, reduces insulin sensitivity, may affect your metabolism. Okay, so it's not only the brain, it's also peripheral organs. And in fact, the uh, modulating the activity of the endocannabinoid system has a therapeutic potential in almost affecting almost any uh, medical disorder. This is a statement made by George Kunos of the NIH, who was my mentor during my postdoctoral training. And I think it's also a very big uh, statement because if we understand it properly, we can modulate it and we can treat diseases. And with this, uh, I think that uh, we need to ask whether we meet the need. And so, I mean, like with, when the NIH, when somebody of that kind of esteem at the NIH says this, I guess there's a whole apparatus the DEA and kind of already set up to sort of say no, but like, how is that not heard, you know, publicly that we think there are th therapeutic value here and we can prove it and we've got studies to prove it. Like, how does that not get listened to? I, I guess think it's it, it takes question, time right? for people to change their perspective. Okay. It takes time and education. We need to educate because I'm sure that many of you present in this uh, webinar were uh, not aware of the fact that there is an endogenous system. Even our uh, medical doctors, okay, MDs, dental uh, students, medical uh, students do not learn. I saw how you did that with the dental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, do not actually know that we have receptors and ligands that are influenced by cannabis. Think about your doctor that prescribed you a prescription for Parkinson. He knows that your dopaminergic system exists and altered, and therefore he signed your prescription. But if you want your doctor to prescribe you cannabis, if he doesn't know that it influences an endogenous system, how can he do it? Okay, so, people into the so it ways. takes time to educate and it should be started very early. So it's curious, you said Parkinson's, but I couldn't, when you said tremors, like I was trying to think what, what is, I kept coming up with a different disease. Parkinson's is what I was thinking about. So I take it then because of the tremor effect, there's being research done in Parkinson's relative to cannabis effect? Definitely. In okay. Parkinson's curious. and many other diseases. Yeah. And in fact, the National oh, Academy go. of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine uh, which is a U.S.-based institution, was asking the same question. What are the health effects of cannabis and cannabinoids? So basically, they ask scientists like myself to review all the public knowledge about cannabis done from the 60s until today in all of these uh, listed diseases. And this uh, uh, booklet, 400 pages, is available online, so you can go to the NAS 
website and download it as a PDF. But their conclusion was that there is a conclusive evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for treating chronic pain, uh, chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, and multiple sclerosis spasticity symptoms. There is only moderate evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for sleep disturbance, and there is limited evidence that cannabis can uh, increase appetite in patients suffering from HIV to treat MS, uh, Tourette syndrome, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, and traumatic brain injury. Professor, do you think it's limited because we haven't done enough research there? Right. Versus it's limited because we've done all this research and it just doesn't work. It's so I, I will extend. There is exactly. no or insufficient evidence for cannabis to treat cancer, addiction, anorexia, IBS, at least according to the NAS, epilepsy. And we know that epilepsy can be treatable by cannabis. So they were looking for evidence-based medicine. Like you are taking an antibiotic, it went throughout the entire regulatory pathway to develop a drug, and it was tested in humans in phase one, two, and three. Long and time. cannabis was not. And therefore, there is insufficient evidence. Okay. And if there is insufficient evidence, can we consider cannabis as a drug? So their conclusion is that the more we learn, the less we know, and we need to do more clinical research to establish, the, first of all, the safety and, of course, the efficacy of a, a cannabis. And with this and, of course, the vision of you need to invest in research. You need to invest in research. Funded research could make new discoveries, can support it, and, of course, make it much more uh, eligible for uh, uh, our people, right? And with this and the vision of the Raphael Meshulam, um, the, as I mentioned, now you understand why he's the godfather, yeah, right, sure. uh, of cannabis research. We established in the Hebrew University the multidisciplinary center for cannabinoid research but that basically integrates and coordinates the research activities of many laboratories working with cannabis, with the endocannabinoid system, and synthetic cannabinoids, which are also very important. And I will give some example later on during my presentation. I would like to show with you a short movie about the center sure. and we can continue the discussion uh, furthermore. Sounds great. Okay, so our center, as I call it, the Multidisciplinary Center for Cannabinoid Research, or the MCCR in short, it's basically one of the biggest and the only uh, research institution in Israel conducting a, a research on cannabinoids or cannabis in general. And it is only among the five biggest institutions in the world conducting research. It serves as a an engine for research and development from very early stages until clinical trials. And uh, say, so how yes, many people sure. are we talking about? Uh, are we talking about a couple of people in a closet? Or are we talking about how many folks are involved in the... We are talking about around 40 research laboratories. So think about my own laboratory that has around uh, 15 people. So we are talking about 400 people. people. Uh, working at the Hebrew University, actively involved in cannabis research every day in order to make new discoveries and, and, and to promote the knowledge. Our research area basically expands from cancer to nutrition, drug delivery, drug development, allergy, autism, you name it, okay? 
And uh, it is done, as I mentioned, by 40 research uh, scientists, well-established uh, team uh, located in various campuses and faculties around the Hebrew University. And uh, with their esteemed work, we have our management, of course, Rafael Meshulam, as I mentioned, is still active, he's our president, I'm the director, we have a, an academic team. And our objective basically is to stimulate and coordinate research activities and at the multidisciplinary level. What does it mean? It means that the scientists who work with the plant in the agriculture faculty basically communicate with the chemist and at the school with the drug development person and at the end with the clinician, trying to find out a solution and to bring the drug as fast as uh, to the, uh, the clinic. We cultivate close interaction with other research institutions around the globe, uh, in Israel and of course uh, in the States, Europe and others, and we foster close interaction with the industry. And this is a, a, a real big deal here because the industry and uh, companies that are interested in, first of all, evaluate their own compounds or would like to enter the field, uh, come to us. We serve as a CRO. We basically have the knowledge, we have the models, we have the capability to run any type of studies related to cannabis. So explain CRO to the group, what's that mean? CRO, we, basically we do service for those companies, okay? Uh, and also uh, any drug, any uh, um, uh, patent that is generated at the scientist level at the Hebrew University can be licensed to this company uh, further on that will take it further to clinical evaluation. So that slide which showed you're doing your own research on all kinds of areas, right. but people will also come to you, pharma, biotech, and say, we have an idea, we wanna research this. They'll engage with your team to sort of create a research project, um, and then we'll create licensing back and forth relative to what you find. Perfectly. Okay, got yes. it. And uh, I will give you a taste of our research we have Currently, I'm sorry for a second. I thought you were going to talk about the taste of cannabis. Uh, okay, right, right. Right. Uh, we have more than 100 uh, research projects currently running in the center. So we develop ex new extraction procedures for the isolation of the plant cannabinoids. We test the efficacy of cannabinoids in different medical conditions, as I mentioned, and the array of conditions is really large. We design novel drug delivery system for cannabinoids. One of the main obstacles in cannabis that it cannot be consumed orally as a drug because it has a lower bioavailability. It does not penetrate our gut. And therefore we need to find new solution uh, in order to increase the bioavailability. So the ability to people to take a pill and to be treated and not just to smoke, okay? And we use nanotechnology for this uh, in order to make it a more uh, better packaged uh, and, um, and okay, so let me dissect that. Or, uh, so, so we're talking about that a pill, less, more difficult for a pill to be ingested to get into the gut to have the effect versus somebody smoking. To have the right, effect, that's because it. the compounds, the cannabinoid compounds are basically degraded in the gut, so they don't reach. Ah, so when you take a pill, the gut degrades the, okay. Right, and therefore you need to create a specific drug formulation that protects them while they are penetrating our circulation, our blood. And once they are in the blood, they will do what they Okay, to. so the research is now focusing on kind of avoiding that gut interaction Correct. that create, breaks it down too quickly. Definitely. Got it, okay. Definitely. Or creating other novel technologies to give it, like with patches on your skin, eye drops, uh, uh, um, drops, of course, under the tongue, buckle, uh, uh, mucosa and so on. So yes, so there are different modalities to administer cannabis, not only by smoking. Uh, as you know, smoking is not that good to your health. Yes, so yes. you need to avoid it. I've been told. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we assess the role of endocannabinoid system in allergy. This is another e example and define the psychiatric role of cannabinoids, of course, and test the antibacterial and, uh, and antifungal effect of cannabinoids that also can be maybe the next antibiotics uh, in the future. So this is just a taste. And if I just present you some of our success in number in the last two years of COVID. Yeah, I was just gonna say that I'm curious, one, during COVID, did it 
did the research, you know, diminish? Sounds like no. No. Um, and where have we seen success? So it sounds like we're about to go there, which is right, great. Right. So we published more than 100 uh, 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 papers and manuscript in top journals that just describe the efficacy, potency of cannabis and cannabinoid products. We patented more than 50 patents. Actually, the Hebrew University and the MCCR is the leading research institution in the world in creating patents around cannabis. And our patents, first of all, patents at the Hebrew University are belongs to the scientists, the Hebrew University. And then we get the option to license them. And we do so through our tech technology transfer company that is called Yisum. So companies that are interested, first of all, we have a shelf. You can get to the shelf and take whatever you are interested in, which type of patent. It's, is it the delivery methodology? Is it a new cannabinoid that was just discovered? You name it. And we can, uh, most of the activity of Yisum is now focused on cannabinoid. And think about it. It's, we are talking about the Hebrew University that generates many patents, like uh, if you know Mobileye, that was uh, put in the in in the car system. It was Waze. 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 yeah, everything was developed uh, uh, in Israel and in the Hebrew U. So, and we in the last uh, two years we uh, acquired uh, more than twenty million dollars for funding. So, so we, it's just like sort of settling in on my brain. Okay, so Hebrew University does a massive amount of research. There's a lot of it's sort of the leading patented uh, university in Israel. They're doing all kinds of scientific research, yet most of the research where we're getting patents is in the cannabinoid field. Is that fair? Uh, almost uh, 25% yeah. of the patents. patents at the Hebrew University are related to cannabis. So an incredible uptake over the last 10, 15 years. Of course, that coincides with when you're there. Right. Yeah. Um, and the amount of research that's leading to patented technology and the folks that are using this would be kind of industry as well as biotech, as well as kind of big pharma. Absolutely. Okay. Correct. Yes. So where do we get our funding from? This is a, a, a big question because there it can be divided to nonprofit organizations. So the government support us, sure. the Ministry of Science, Agriculture, Technology, uh, but also the Israel Science Foundation, the European uh, uh, Research Councils, and so on. But also we have a very... Uh, nice collaboration models with the industry. So we created this uh, type of uh, log to either have small biotech companies that are interested to sponsor uh, a small studies in the field and get the option to license the product at the end, or we can create hubs related to addiction, related to metabolic disorders. Uh, and this is also being funded by companies that are interested. And we are looking also for center partner, which can have this type of an umbrella view of the center and its activity and fund research throughout the years uh, and get, of course, the opportunity to take those uh, patents further on. And quick, quick question from the field. So Thomas asks, uh, Professor, are there studies and data showing positive effects of cannabis on lowering blood pressure? Many doctors seem to refer to cannabis as potentially causing high blood pressure. So are there studies, research being done on blood pressure and cannabis? Yes, definitely. This is a good question because our heart is being affected by cannabinoids, but not for the good uh, uh, effect, I would say. So blood pressure uh, regulation is not only controlled by our heart, but also by the kidney and other organs. And since the effect is not very specific, it may affect different organs and influence our blood pressure, not in the right direction that we are looking for. So I wouldn't say that cannabis is good for treating your blood pressure. Uh, it may affect it, but it really depends at which type or which uh, uh, area of blood pressure you start or level you start from. So it's really complicated. It's not easy. And there is actually a scientist at the NIH here in the uh, U.S. called uh, Dr. Paul Pacher, who is investigating this specifically, not at the Hebrew youth. So I'm, I'm, I'm sharing information with you uh, that is done also in the U.S. So you may look for his uh, publications in this field. Great. 
So uh, other than so the collaboration models with the industry, I will just show you a short list of companies that actually invested in uh, technologies that were developed at the Hebrew University or decided to use use uh, uh, or utilize our uh, uh, our ability to uh, work with cannabis and generate a uh, novel uh, knowledge in this field. This is a, again a short list just in the last uh, year or so. So uh, with that, I think the part of the MCCR uh, and uh, is over, but I can. Perfect. Continue. So let, let's talk a bit about some of the kind of research and where it's been directed. So, you know, we had that list, the whole long list of kind of where um, we've seen some success. Let's talk a little bit about, I know you and I were chatting beforehand about autism spectrum disorder. So my older guy for the folks on the call uh, is on the spectrum. He's like a little bit of um, a mutt, a lovable mutt, but a mutt. He's got all kinds of different pieces of different things. And I've we've read and we've you know, researched and talked to people about kind of cannabis and uh, autism. So give us a little bit, uh, you know, 10,000 feet if you would, or you can get down to one foot if you want. Um, has there been progress there? Is there a lot of research going on in that area? And what other areas are you sensing kind of progress in? So specifically in autism, I will get into it uh, uh, later on. But if you think about cannabis as a drug to treat diseases, you need to consider these three different options that are listed here. Uh, it either can be a whole plant product that you can either smoke or vape or uh, take it as a eatable, or you can ask yourself whether you would like to be treated with a single molecule that was plant-derived compound or use synthetic. So I will highlight each and every category here and give you specific examples that were done at the Hebrew U and were translated including autism. Great. So the first one is whole plant product. And why do I think whole plant product may not be the best way to, uh, 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 to think about a drug or a therapy? Because if we think about how many cannabis, uh, different cannabis strains exist, the question originally uh, would take us to three, only three, the sativa, indica, and ruderalis with a uh, Sativa generated the hemp that contains less than 0.3% of THC and all the other uh, CBD, but the marijuana or the medical cannabis that we are uh, currently facing is the combination of sativa and indica. And with this amount of uh, uh, strains that were uh, throughout the history were cloned, not professionally in order to uh, change really the, the ratio between the cannabinoids that are present in the plant. We are now may consider plants as with high THC, low CBD, uh, same amount. This is a very superficial level of understanding that we do have only THC and CBD. Because if you still consider whole plant product, you should understand that we have 140 different cannabinoids inside the plant. In, it's not just THC and CBD. It's CBD, but CBN, CBG, and many others. And we do have 120 terpenes and almost 27 flavonoids and sugars, amino acids, and other molecules. We are talking about thousands of molecules. So how do you create a drug if you extract it from the plant and you know exactly that your extraction was correct? You got the same amount over time of these products and in order to treat the disease. Think about you taking an antibiotic. You know exactly that you have 500 milligram of uh, clarithromycin or uh, any other antibiotics. You don't have anything else there. How do you do and you take this and develop it into a drug? This makes it much more complicated to use whole plant product as a medicine. And therefore, I think the, the two other options are much more uh, uh, beneficial for us. So let's go back though. So Dr. Raphael was the one that separated all these 140? Almost, almost all. Almost, almost all of them. Okay, so his research led to kind of breaking down these um, cannabinoids within the plant, not just THC, but all the 140. Right. Got it, okay. Right. 
uh, and, and we need to understand. So it takes us to the second part uh, to discuss single molecules or plant-derived product. And I told you that we are having 140 uh, different cannabinoids or phytocannabinoids. So which one of them is active? But you can see that CBD, for example, is very active and it activates not only CB1 or CB2, it activates other receptors and it has an anti uh, ischemic effect, an anti uh, uh, diabetic effect, and many others. But you can see also that the other phytocannabinoids have also their own effect. So, which one we should uh, choose? So, the question arises if we would like to uh, uh, see what the regulatory actually. Uh, uh, approved. And Sativex is one example for this. So the FDA actually approved Sativex a long time ago. And this is a ratio of one to one THC and CBD to treat a, a spasticity uh, that is one of the features a, a, a patient with multiple sclerosis suffering from. And Sativex is a good example for a plant derived product that are well characterized. We know exactly the ratio. We don't have anything else there. And it was found beneficial and it was uh, licensed or uh, produced over 25 countries around the, uh, the globe. Quick but, question, yes. sorry to interrupt. So um, Paul asks, uh, is just to jump ahead a little bit, but we're not gonna jump that far. Uh, what, what's the research say on claims that cannabis causes schizophrenic activity? Are there any, is there any actual evidence of causation or correlation relative to schizophrenia? Yes, this is a very good question. And schizophrenia and psychiatric disorders are known to be a, not caused, but affected by a cannabinoid, specifically THC. And I would elaborate about it because studies have shown that if children or adolescents use a cannabis, uh, high levels of THC during adolescence, uh, and they have the uh, predisposed uh, genetic uh, uh, linkage in their family for psychiatric disorders, they may develop later on in their life uh, schizophrenia. Uh, the fact that they are using, these people are using during adolescence may increase by 40% the chances wow. that they will get a schizophrenic attack while they are adult. And once you have schizophrenia, you cannot go back. You should be treated. Um, and if we take a, another uh, side of it, think about synthetic cannabinoids that are being sold unofficially in the market. And these are the, those uh, um, uh, drugs that are being sold unofficially. They have a uh, synthetic cannabinoids that basically activate the receptor constitutively. What it means that it, the, the, the ligands that they are using always bind to the receptor. And by doing that, it may induce a psychiatric uh, disorder. Yes, which we do not see with THC, by the way, but it's there. Gotcha. Um, and one other question, again, we're just jumping around a bit. Um, does the center do any research into cultivation methodologies and efficacy on cultivation? Yes, we do at the Faculty of Agriculture. We have a few scientists that are working in this room. Super. Thanks for that. Yes. Okay, so back to, we were talking about plant derivation and we're talking about molecules. Right. So we've got Sativex, which seems to have great effect relative to multiple sclerosis. Um, we interrupted you there. So what other things are we seeing kind of in the deliverable yeah. that people have used kind of research to execute on? So actually, Sativex was one of the first compound approved by, by the FDA. But recently, in 2018, the FDA approved CBD plant-derived compound to treat a, a rare conditions of epilepsy that are called the Nox Gestalt and Dravat syndrome. The drug was developed by GW Pharma, okay? And it was called Epidiolex, and it was tested in three clinical randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials. And this also brings me back to the fact how we need 
this clinical data and evidence-based medicine in order to make the regulatory affairs to approve such drugs. And this is a very good example for the FDA changing its at, attitude, attitude yep. and atmosphere and accepting plant-derived compound. This is only CBD, pure CBD. But the question arises, why we should have waited until June uh, 2018? Because Jean Davis was a student at the University of Utah. She worked with Dr. Lennox, uh, uh, Lennox who st studied these epileptic seizures. And she reported in the Salt Lake City Telegram in 1949 that cannabis can be useful to treat this epilepsy. Okay, so why we should have waited until 2018? And you know what? Not going back until 1948. Let's go only 30 years ago. 30 years ago, again, Professor Rafael Meshulam at the Hebrew University tested the ability of CBD in a double-blind placebo-controlled trial to treat epilepsy in 15 epileptic children, epileptic uh, patients, sorry. He dosed them around 200 to 30, uh, 300 milligrams for almost five months, and he showed that four patients out of eight remain absolutely completely free of seizures, three patients have partial improvement, and one patient had no improvement. And this was published in 1980, 30 years ago, and nobody picked it up since then. And why is that? This is a, an open question, I would guess. Okay, so this is an idea uh, how we should make more clinical trials available specifically in the field. And you asked me about autism. Yeah. So autism is, uh, you know, it's a spectrum. It's a spectrum and people who suffers from autism suffer from impairment in social interaction, in communication, in, and may have some uh, restricted and repetitive behavior. 50% uh, of the children suffering from autism do have behavioral difficulties with tantrums and outbreaks and anxiety, and 40% do not respond to the current medication because the medication do not really fit with their uh, syndrome. And we know, and I already mentioned it briefly, that the endocannabinoid system is implicated in changing our brain activity, right? Because of the CB1 receptor present there, endocannabinoid. And we know also that cannabis and endocannabinoids are also have the ability to, to increase our social interaction. Actually, you smoke pot in the presence of your friends. You don't do it, it privately. That's uh, actually uh, what cannabis make us uh, 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 engaged. I think there are some that may smoke in the privacy yeah. room, but, you but know, they but will I'm enjoy it uh, yeah, with, more, yeah. with their friends. Yes. Now we do have evidence in the cli in the in the uh, laboratories that. Sorry, I can't let that go. So for the people <laughs> online, I know who you are, and I know some of you. So did you hear what the professor just said? Smoking by yourself less than smoking with others. Okay. okay. Back to the presentation. Right. He didn't say that. I put words in his mouth there. But yes. Take it from there. Exactly. And uh, we know uh, through uh, basic uh, studies that we conducted in, uh, in our laboratories that there is in model, mouse models for autism, there is change in endocannabinoid activity. And we really wanted to know whether it also exists in humans. So what we did, we collected blood samples from uh, autistic children versus children without autism. These are 93 children with autism versus 93 uh, regular uh, uh, healthy children. And you can see here that most of the children with autism have severe uh, uh, behavioral problems. They take medications and so on. And I told you that we are able to measure endocannabinoid tone. So in the blood, I know to measure what is the level of endocannabinoids. I really would like to understand if, it, if it's similar or changed. And what we found that they have reduced tone of the endocannabinoid system. So they, they do not produce enough endocannabinoids in their body, which may influence their behavior, which may lead to their uh, uh, less communication skills and so on. So with that knowledge in hand, and we knew that CBD 
is able to modulate the endocannabinoid system internally. So if you take CBD, it will affect it. We went to do a clinical trial in uh, children with autism. We collected 60 children with autism with severe behavioral problems and with a failure to proper medical and behavioral treatment. And we gave them a whole plant extract CBD uh, strains and for up to one year. And the surprising results were that 60% of the children show improved in behavior, 50% improved in their communication skills and 40% improvement in anxiety. Actually, the parents of these children called us and told us, what did you do with our kid? He first time ever, he approached me and called me mommy or daddy. This was a huge change in the atmosphere of having the ability of cannabinoids to treat, not to reverse autism. We are not going to treat autism, but the symptoms that are so diminishing effects. Of course, and it was led to a double-blind placebo-controlled trials in Israel that replicated these studies and open up into a multi-center a, a clinical trials in the States, Canada, Europe, Israel, based on studies that were developed at us. So this is whole plant. So how, how it's is it? It's whole plant, but specifically so only CBD. Only CBD. So, okay. So let's talk about that for half a second. Um, let's sort of unpack hemp, CBD, THC, kind of for those uninitiated, what's the difference between the three and how does that affect what we're talking about? So we have the hemp. Hemp contains 0.3 up to 0.3 THC and 3%, uh, maybe a bit more of CBD. This is the amount of uh, cannabinoids that you can extract from hemp. If you do use uh, cannabinoids uh, uh, from medical cannabis or marijuana, you can, of course, extract more, more of the THC, more of the CBD, and it really depends on the strain. Okay, so, but it needs to be quantified and measured. And in this study, we used actually a ratio of 20 to one CBD to THC. We need a bit of THC there, okay? And what's THC for the uninitiated? The THC in does this, what? It's, this, it's the psychoactive compound. So but the hallucinogen. The, yes, but it's very, very low. Small. Level. Very, very low. We are very cautious, as I told you, to use THC in children specifically because their brain is being developed. And uh, uh, I told you about the, the yeah. risk for development of psychiatric okay. disorders. So we would like to avoid as much as possible using uh, THC. So we've got kind of a 20 to one uh, CBD or CBD, CBD to, to THC. THC. Right. So again, for the, you know, the, to get high, the high comes from the THC. Correct. The CBD, we have talking about kind of this medicinal effect uh, for the various and sundry maladies. Okay, correct. Got it. So with that, I will uh, uh, not finish, but almost finish my presentation uh, and show, show you uh, two examples of developing synthetic cannabinoids based on the knowledge come from the plant as a pharmaceuticals that can be developed into a, a well-characterized drug. And before I do so, now I'm, I'm um, as you presented me, I'm heading and directing this multidisciplinary center for cannabinoid research, but I'm also the uh, head of my own laboratory, which is focused on obesity and metabo metabolic disorders such as diabetes, fatty liver disease, and so on. This is my main focus. I'm trying to develop drugs to treat metabolic disorders based on cannabis and cannabinoids. And to give you a teaser of what I'm doing, I will show you another movie. I hope it will work much better than the other Quick one. Quick question before the movie. So, yes. um, all right. So, but first of all, where, if you're doing all this stuff, when are you sleeping? Are you sleeping wrong? Yes. It's a little bit, okay. Pretty good. Pretty and without Ken. Uh, thank you. I was just going to go there. Very impressively <laughs> rude. Anticipating that. Tom writes in, I've been reading that one of the major industries to lobby against cannabis legalization is the ketamine industry. Do you think that cannabis can be more effective and safer to address pain management and get FDA approval as companies like GW Pharma do their thing? So it seems like ketamine, is that, is that a fair characterization? I don't know ketamine industry. So is, are you sensing that ketamine is lobbying against the cannabis? K 
ketamine and uh, other psychedelic uh, uh, drugs are now considered maybe to be the next, next thing. era to 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 be at right so yeah, uh, like but we have not finished dealing with cannabis yeah, sure. so but uh, i think both uh, will work in parallel and will continue to uh, to be developed they have each one of these psychedelics versus cannabinoids uh, have their own effects and will further be elaborated uh, throughout the next couple of years i i believe that there is space for for everyone. For everyone. Yeah, yes, whatever, as long as it works and as long as it's research. Um, okay, so back to synthetics. We're not talking about like the stuff that we're selling on the street, like uh, right. no. Spice and Delta 8 and all that no. kind of stuff. So what are we talking about? We are talking about pharmaceutical grade uh, compounds, uh, drugs, basically, that you can prescribe and get from your doctors. And as I told you, I will show you a brief teaser of my, not my work, but... The work. Yes. One San Francisco Girl Scout is proving a shrewd businesswoman making money off the munchies. The Green Cross, a marijuana dispensary, posted photos to its Facebook page this week of 13-year-old Danielle Lay selling her Girl Scout cookies outside its doors. After 45 minutes, she had to call for reinforcement cookies, backups. And um, her mother was quoted saying that she sold about 117 boxes in two hours. Danielle and her mom did not want to be interviewed on TV, but Danielle's mom told KPIX she was a good opportunity to both show her daughter different areas of their city and to have a mature conversation about drugs. The East Bay Express quotes Carol, the girls learn that users are not drugged out. Many have serious needs and are just a little different. And they get very hungry after, said Danielle. Yes, a lesson about pot, but Danielle's marijuana money move is also getting her praise as brilliant, savvy, even genius. We're just surprised there's not a dude at the end of some of these headlines. KPIX spoke with the Girl Scouts of Northern California, and they're fine with where Danielle set up her stand. She will be back at the Green Cross Saturday, and some of the money made off of selling her cookies to research for Alzheimer's. For Newsy, I'm Lauren Zima. So, Brett, tell me, what did you learn from this uh, short movie? I'm thinking that uh, there's a future in selling cookies outside of dispensaries. <laughs> yes. I don't think so. So, first of all, you need to listen to your parents, right? And uh, location in life is very important. Location is always important. It's also important. And uh, the third thing, I guess, that cannabis increases munchies, right? And, Good. And I learned feeding. earlier in your presentation that right. it's affecting some hypothalamus in the yes, brain, right. which causes appetite. So I, I think personally, I need the hypothalamus to go the other way. <laughs> right. So, we can work so on that. therefore, if we're thinking about an anti-obesity drug, we should not use THC. Although, if you think about it, chronic users with uh, that consume cannabis high THC for a long period of time, they are not obese. They actually lean. They actually have uh, uh, improved metabolism, low blood pressure, and uh, uh, no, low uh, blood sugar, sorry. Uh, and the question arises, why? Because they see every time the THC and the receptor, the CB1, is downregulated in there. So it's not the fact that it increases only the munchies acutely, but chronic dosing of THC may actually be beneficial to treat obesity. However, you, would, uh, you don't want everyone to be stoned, right? So it's not a really good option. And therefore we think about, okay, so how do we treat obesity with cannabis or with cannabinoids? So one example is CBD because it's a non-psychoactive okay. and uh, our studies in the lab show that if you use cannabis, it can reduce your hunger drive and improve weight loss. And there are clinical trials actually with patients, with uh, epileptic children taking CBD and they so reduced in appetite and it has an anti-inflammatory role. And obesity in general is an inflammatory disease. So if you control inflammation, you can reduce weight. Now, if you think about CBD, it's available. How, how can I develop something uh, that is available to everyone as a drug? Big pharma companies will not take it further into the clinic because everyone can take it. Why do develop to invest billions of dollars in a drug 
that basically everyone can have it. So we thought outside the box and we went and we know that CBD in the plant is present as an acid. It's called CBD acid. And this acid is not that stable and therefore people cannot use it. So what we did, we changed the acid. We did a small modification in its structure and we created a novel molecule that is called CBDAO methyl ester or in the short term, EPM301. This is a novel CBD analog, CBDA analog. It has an increased stability and efficacy. And when we give it to animal, mo uh, animal models for depression and anxiety, it also reduces their depression and anxiety. And we asked, okay, so if it does work on depression and anxiety, which also features of patients suffering from morbid obesity, can it treat also obesity? So in my lab, the model that I'm using, it's called diet-induced obesity. We take animals, mice, when they are six weeks of age, we feed them with high-fat diet for 14 weeks. Think about you eating McDonald's every day, all day long. Don't want to think about okay? that. Okay. And nothing against McDonald's, by the way. Okay. And uh, after 14 weeks, we treat them for 28 days with our compound. And an animal at, at that level uh, of obesity is around uh, 50 grams, okay? So look what happens if you give these animals in, in pink or purple here, uh, the drug EPM301 from around 50 grams in white. These are uh, uh, mice that basically uh, were receiving placebo. Uh, their weight was reduced, their fat mass was reduced significantly. We saw that EPM301 has the ability to improve fatty liver disease as well. Fatty liver is one of the main condition that is associated with obesity. 40% of the people suffering in the world, whether they are lean or obese, suffering from fatty liver, it's accumulation of fat in the liver. And by treating with EPM301, we were able to reduce uh, hepatic uh, triglyceride accumulation and we cleared the li their liver uh, completely from, from fat. EPM301 as a synthetic CBDA analog was able to reduce our triglycerides in the blood and to reduce cholesterol level, maybe could be the next statin uh, in the future. So with this drug, we patented as we know how to do it, uh, and we license it to a company called EPM that takes it further on into clinical evaluation. So this is one example of how you're using your knowledge from the plant and you translate it into a drug that could be the next anti-obesity drug in okay, the so, future. So EPM is now in FDA trials relative to They humans. are now in the process of submitting a, a, a request to the FDA to Got start it. clinical trials yes, in humans. Another example for synthetic cannabinoids, I told you about the receptor for CB1. CB1, I told you that is present all of our body. Now, if we are focusing more on the metabolic syndrome, I told you that if we activate the same receptor in the gut, in the liver, in, in fat, it increases fat accumulation. So we thought, why not trying to block this receptor? We can design molecule that block the receptor and therefore by that you can reduce fat. And in fact, there was a drug in the market. There was a drug in the market that was called Accomplia. It was developed by Sanofi Aventis that was called Rimonabant or Accomplia, this was the name. And the drug was given to patient. It was never approved by the FDA, but by the European uh, Regulatory Affairs. And it was a magic drug. It was a magic bullet because every person that took this drug lost their weight, their, their, it controls his, his or her diabetic. Uh, it reduces uh, 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 levels of cholesterol and so on. However, it caused side effect. And why is that? Because the, the drug blocked the CB1 receptor in the brain and caused anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation, right? Because if you smoke pot, you feel happy, right? If you block the receptor of cannabis, you will get the opposite. So then we came into the idea, why not using this remonaband that was abandoned 
It was withdrawn from the market and change it. Change it in a way that it will not reach the brain. It will not affect the CB1 receptor in the brain. It will only uh, block the, uh, the receptors in adipocytes, in the fat, in the liver, in the muscle, and improve metabolism. So we started our journey with over 1,000 different compounds that were synthesized in my lab, okay? And we screened them, and in the end, we have between five to 10 lead molecules. I will show with you one example of this molecule, which is called BNS822 right now. And when we give it to our mice, our obese mice, you see in white, it's a, a, an animal that uh, received the placebo. And in blue, the one that received the drug, you see how his weight was reduced dramatically, body weight reduction around 20%. Believe, believe me or not, obese patients will benefit from this in the future. It also reduced their appetite. It reduces fat mass and the ability to tolerate glucose. So it has an, a, a, an anti-diabetic effect and it also cleared completely the fat from the liver and improved liver injury. So this drug and other drugs that we have developed that basically blocks the CB1 receptor only in peripheral organs were found in my lab. And these are the list of publications that show it, that it not only reverses obesity, but also diabetes and fatty liver disease and dyslipidemia and cancer and kidney disorders and osteoporosis. So you name it, again, we patented those compounds. They are a, a license to be on Anosim or BNS in short. And uh, now if we are trying to look at the pipeline of drug development process, when you start with the initial discoveries and you do some preclinical work in your lab and you screen compounds and you reach the phase to start clinical trials and get to the FDA to have a drug in the market, you know, it takes time and a lot of money. We saw how this time was shrinked during the COVID time with the vaccination, but for to, treat, to have a drug in the market, it uh, takes around 12 to 15 years. But I'm happy to share with you that our drugs are now, the peripheral CB1 blockers are now reaching phase two in humans. And the EPM compound, as you asked, is now almost reaching the clinic uh, by applying to the FDA to start clinical trials. And I take it that the um, the blocker drug was not creating the same anxiety effects that you were seeing from the other. Absolutely, uh, at least not in mice. It is being tested now in humans. Right. Fascinating. Right. So this is a, a, a the, the third example that I wanted to give you, kind of an overview uh, about my studies in the lab. I have, of course, uh, other compounds, other methodologies, not only to treat obesity as general, but also chronic kidney disease, acute kidney injury and many other conditions. Can you go back two slides? I thought I saw something for a second. There we go, on that one. So we talked a little bit about kidney disease. We talked about fatty liver, mm -hmm. uh, diabetes. Uh, let's uh, touch for a second, if you would, on osteoporosis. That's right. curious to me. So bone density or lack thereof, what's the relationship on CBD, THC with kind of osteoporosis? Right. So first of all, we were the first. This is what... When I started my PhD, I was the first, together with my mentor, the late Professor Itai Bab from the Hebrew University, who discovered that bones and bone cells uh, do express the CB1, CB2 receptors. They produce endocannabinoids, and therefore we can manipulate bone mass through cannabis or synthetic cannabinoids. Uh, in fact, it's interesting that uh, uh, um, women uh, who are suffer from osteoporosis. Uh, the majority of those are, are women, and uh, some uh, uh, a small portion of it uh, of these uh, women uh, do have mutations in the cannabinoid receptors, specifically in CB2 receptors, that uh, is linked to the severity of their osteoporosis or bone loss that they are uh, facing. And uh, modulating the receptor by activating the receptors, either by synthetic cannabinoids or maybe THC, may have beneficial effect. Uh, I would uh, try to, to, to highlight the fact that uh, the receptors and the endocannabinoid system also present in our uh, bone and in our chondrocyte area, in our 
a growing plate. So using cannabis during adolescence, bring me again, during adolescence and THC specifically will make our bones to a closed very fast and not letting you grow until you, for your highest lens that you can uh, get. And therefore it's also advisable not to use THC during adolescence because it will influence your height. So these high school stoners that will influence height. Yes. But uh, as we get older and potentially get osteoporosis, some level of CBD, THC with respect to the right receptor might, it's not gonna change it or fix it, but, but it maybe may it'll prevent. Yes, prevent. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Right. Interesting. And so how are those studies going? I was curious. So there are a few groups, not only at the Hebrew University, but uh, uh, also here in the States and in Canada that are just exploring this. We have some uh, lead molecules that know that are considered to be endocannabinoid-like molecules that also have the ability to change uh, bone mass that are not reached yet the, the, the clinic, but are in the process of preclinical evaluation in animal models. Uh, I think it will take time until it, it will be uh, to develop an anti-osteoporotic drug. It takes time because since it's a very chronic disease and you need a, a long time to assess its efficacy in humans, many uh, companies do not really uh, eager to go toward finding. And we do have some uh, drugs in the market, not not the best one, uh, but, uh, and therefore I think it, it will take time for a company with a big uh, a pocket to invest in this. Uh, so we're gonna have a lot of very strong mice for a long time until we can get the- Maybe. Okay, gotcha. Yes. We have one additional question coming in. It says, this might be outside of your realm here. Uh, why aren't more dispensaries selling edibles such as chocolate or cookies? Is it a legal requirement for food-based products? Uh, so I'll take that one. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so the ability to sell different products in dispensaries, at least in the United States, is a state regulatory issue. Um, and so their ability to do that is based on the type of license they have. And depending on what license they have and what products are available, uh, kind of limits the supply. As more states go to um, beyond medical, like New Jersey, New York, relative to um, adult use, you will see more licenses over time that will allow for more edibles in the dispensaries. So that's a timing thing, uh, but each state will regulate kind of that uh, product. Are they selling uh, edibles in uh, Israel? Is there a lot of edible market there? It's only approved for children. Um, huh. in, in Israel, we, are, Only we, not, medical, we right. do not have dispensaries. We do uh, give uh, cannabis in the pharmacy uh, after a patient comes with a, a prescription from a doctor. So it's, it's a, a bit different from what happens here in the States, but it is uh, approved for only children because of way of administration. Gotcha. Um, Wendy writes in, uh, does cannabis cause vertigo? Vertigo, wow. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm familiar with any studies related to vertigo. Okay, Wendy, we'll uh, keep an eye on that and yes. keep you apprised. Um, feel free to write in questions as well. Uh, we're getting towards the end of the witching hour, as it were. Right. Um, so back to you, Professor. Um, where do you see, if you had to look in your crystal ball, so you got a lot of balls in the air. If you had to look in your crystal ball relative to the center, where do you see the center going over the next five years? It sounds like you got more and more, hopefully, dollars coming into the center to support research. We've got licensing and patents that are kind of increasing in scope and size. So that should hopefully bring dollars in to do more research. Do you see the pace picking up more and more? Or what do you what do you think happens over the next five years? So first of all, as a director of the center, I can see and meet companies and representative of these companies like on a weekly basis. The companies that are in the field or would like to enter the field uh, are coming and looking for uh, uh, compounds and technologies in order to increase their portfolio, to take them into this field for the next 10 years. And they will do so if they collaborate or invest uh, or donate money to uh, university-based institutions like the Hebrew University 
because this is the way to, to generate all this knowledge, this novel knowledge. It cannot be done at the, at the research and development phase when a company is just entering clinical trial. They will look for early phase technologies at university and then take it from there. So I believe the future holds a, a lot of uh, uh, collaborations between the industry and the academia. Uh, I think we should feed each other. So we do have the knowledge, but sometimes the need comes from the industry and we need to have a great discussion with them in order to answer their own specific uh, questions. Uh, um, and vice versa. So we have these, if we, if we get uh, big donations or investment, we can of course uh, create crazy ideas. Think about Rafi at the beginning of his life, how much money he received from the government to, to just explore his crazy ideas about cannabis and how it brought us here. So if we do the, the, this type of in, uh, uh, investment, of course the, the future holds only good things. Yeah, look, uh, just from the last hour of our discussion, we're talking about uh, kind of all sorts of different issues that can be hopefully addressed or diminished. You know, we mentioned or you talked about epilepsy and diabetes and MS and autism, liver disease, Parkinson's, obesity, depression, cholesterol reduction, osteoporosis. I mean, that's kind of the last five, 10 years. I mean, right. that, and that's an extraordinary amount of things to be unpackaged. Uh, relative to a 10 year period. And so again, I can, you know, the future feels like it's bright relative to the ability to take research and then execute on, you know, either drug regimes or kind of uh, deliverables uh, to affect symptoms um, and to diminish symptoms, right. which is right. pretty extraordinary. And you should appreciate the fact that research takes time. It's not, a, and, and, and the cannabis is not a magic bullet. Okay, for everything, mm -hmm. we need to really sort it out to understand what exactly, what, uh, which dosage to, uh, to use and for which clinical indication it could be a uh, benefit. We just got another question before we wrap up. How does cannabis or could cannabis assist with dementia? Oh, this is a, an, an interesting question, not about dementia specifically, but cognitive decline that is associated with a, a dementia. What we have uh, uh, shown that during uh, aging, there is a reduction in endocannabinoid tone, which is very high during adolescence and it goes down. So if you give- I'm giggling because you said high, I couldn't help myself. It was very high during- <laughs> Yes, sorry. right. And uh, if you give a, a very low levels of THC during aging, it may reverse this cognitive decline or prevent it. Uh, so this has been research? this has been shown in animal models, of course. Okay. But based on these studies that have been published, uh, there were uh, a, a few clinics that actually took it into their own practice and prescribed cannabis, very low level of THC, to uh, uh, old people in order to prevent their uh, cognitive. Do you see more studies being done in that uh, area? Yes, definitely. Okay. I think uh, with the baby boom here in the States, yeah. uh, uh, the population right now is just getting even older. So our uh, uh, life uh, expansion uh, is, is, is big and, and large and we will face the aging uh, population to be uh, suffer from many diseases and will be here for a long period of time. So we need to give them certain. Uh, so Janine, on that one, stay tuned. It sounds like uh, more research or research being done now and more research to come uh, as you know the population ages, kind of the ability to uh, assist with diminish some of the symptoms relative to Hodgkin's Parkinson's, uh, Alzheimer's, very relevant and uh, being focused upon, which is great. Right. All right. So it sounds like the future is bright um, relative to the research. It sounds like you've got a lot going on. It sounds like money is always an object. So we sort of the more money you have, the more research you can do, the more people that we can hire to sort of do the research. Yeah. So money is always an issue, but um, you're being supported by not only government, but by private industry, but there's never enough money. 
it sounds like the private industry comes, you know, with a, a thought. They want you to look in a particular area as opposed to where you want to do other research. Right. But, you know, you do get funds to do kind of not pet projects, but things that you're all thinking about. Um, do you find that uh, countries are coming to you as well or is it just private industry? That's uh, interesting because uh, I haven't told you, but uh, one of the um, uh, goals of our center is also to, to collaborate with the Israeli Man Ministry of Health and to conduct this, what we call the medicalization process in Israel and to educate medic uh, medical pra pra practitioners, uh, pharmacists, nurses in the field of uh, cannabinoids. And we created together with the Ministry of Health, this green book that is available online uh, that basically educate uh, the uh, medical practitioners how to dose cannabis for which type of clinical indications it, it is good uh, uh, for and, and, and more information about the endocannabinoid system, background information, history, and so on. And uh, governments around the globe are uh, uh, collaborating with us or come to Israel to learn about our process of medicalization and including the FDA. The FDA uh, here uh, invited the Israel medical cannabis agencies within the Ministry of Health to come and educate the FDA about our problem. How do we do it uh, differently of not having dispensaries, but having it as a drug prescription? And Yossi, where would people find the Green Book if they wanted to go and read and learn more? So just click a Green Book IMCA. Uh, IMCA, it's the Israel Medical Cannabis Agencies, uh, and you will find it. Okay, so um, also let me just step probe there. So other resources that you would suggest the audience if they want to learn more um, sort of not necessarily dialogue with you personally, but they can do that too. Uh, where should they go? Where, do, where would you suggest they look? So first of all, you can uh, contact me, okay? We'll give, here, us, we'll give us a home phone number in a minute. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's over there. So hey. you have the link to our website at the Hebrew University. So you can explore all the research activities that is done in the center. Of course, my contact information is there if you have any question or would like to invest, collaborate, whatever. Uh, I think it will be beneficial for people who are attending this seminar uh, to, uh, to be engaged in activities that are related to research. And I mean by, by for example, uh, participating in the International Cannabinoid Research Society meeting that is done annually around the end of June. Just a, a month ago, it was in, in Ireland. Next year, actually, it's in Canada, in Toronto. Okay. Very close. So uh, be a, a member and come to these meetings uh, to learn, to educate yourself, and of course to uh, network and maybe take some technologies that are available there. Fantastic. Look, fascinating uh, hour plus, whatever it was, uh, talking, learning. Uh, your work is extraordinary, and uh, we're so grateful that you were able to join us today. We'll stay in touch. We would love to sort of continue the conversation. I'm sure your research is constantly evolving, and so there's always something else to learn. And uh, we have people online that are, you know, very interested in consuming, you know, that information and that knowledge. So, again, really appreciate the time. Good luck with all of your efforts and those of your team. And uh, stay in touch with us. Yeah, Brad, thank you so much for having me here. It's really a pleasure. Thank Pleasure's you. ours. Everybody, thanks for tuning in. We appreciate the time uh, and the brain wattage. Uh, in particular, we appreciate Rachel uh, for making, you can't see her, but we're looking at her, uh, for making uh, Dr. Yossi available, Professor Yossi, available to us. And uh, thanks for taking the time with us.